Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open, a podcast featuring conversations with artists, writers, and curators. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 86. Today's guest is Lydia Kiesling. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, I'm talking with writer Lydia Kiesling. Lydia Kiesling is the author of The Golden State and a 2018 National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree. She is a contributing editor at The Millions, and her writing has appeared at outlets including The New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker Online, The Guardian, and Slate. So Lydia's debut novel, The Golden State, was published in September of 2018, and I read it earlier this year. It's the story of Daphne, a young mother who is having to raise her toddler daughter, Honey, on her own, not because she's single, but because they've been separated from her Turkish husband due to a processing error with the immigration offices. At the beginning of the book, Daphne suddenly leaves her job and life in San Francisco, takes Honey out of daycare, and goes on this road trip back to her mother's hometown, a fictional town called Alta Vista, California, in the far northeastern part of the state. Now, like a lot of people, I was immediately struck by the sort of stream of consciousness portrayal of the thoughts of a young parent with a young child. You get this really close view into exactly what Daphne is going through moment to moment throughout the day with her daughter. And it just felt so true to what I remember of that time in my own kids' lives in a way that I've never really seen done before. But the book also talks about place and memory and how those things interact with each other, looking at this part of my home state that tends to be pretty overlooked, both in literature and in real life. It looked at what it means to be from a place, at different ways a person can belong or be excluded. I really just loved this book. In our conversation, Lydia and I talked about The Golden State. We also talked a bunch about her nonfiction, her essay writing, which is also something that I enjoy. I put links in the show notes to several of the essays that we discussed, and I do highly recommend checking those out. And if you have time, it's even worth going and checking out her other essays, too. She's got a whole bunch of them listed on the other writing page of her website, and I put a link to that in the show notes as well. Now, if you're listening to this on the day it's released, this coming weekend, there's a chance to see Lydia at the LA Times Festival of Books. On Sunday, April 14th, 2019, at 12.30 p.m., Lydia will be on a panel called Versions of California, talking with four other writers about their various fictional Californias and the characters that inhabit those settings. Tickets are required, but are free with a small service fee, so do check that out. I've put a link in the show notes. This week, subscribers to the KTCO Patreon campaign will be getting a new bonus reading from Lydia Kiesling, who is reading an excerpt from The Golden State. Just happened that she picked one of my favorite passages from the book. That joins our growing archive of readings by writers including Shivani Ramlochan, Nicole Chung, Franny Choi, Rachel Lyon, Ada Limon, and more. If you've been listening to the show for a while and you like what you're hearing, if getting to hear these conversations has meant something to you, please do consider making a pledge by going to patreon.com slash sake river. Your donations are the only source of revenue for the show, the only thing paying for the costs of uh, hosting and producing this show. And a donation in any amount gets you access to each episode a day early, plus access to the full archive of bonus readings. Once again, that's patreon.com slash sake river, and there's a link in the show notes for that. Okay, so let's get started, shall we? As always, if you'd like to join in the conversation, you can use the hashtag ChannelOpenFiction on Twitter for your comments and questions. And now here's my conversation with Lydia Kiesling. Okay, so how are you today? I am well, thanks. Uh, how are you? I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm a little tired, but <laughs> that's about yes. normal for when you've got kids, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So I, first off, I just wanted to say, I really enjoyed the hell out of your book and there were a lot of things I enjoyed about it, but since I, you know, mentioned the parenting thing, like that's certainly an aspect that I, I really appreciated the, how that experience is depicted in it, mm -hmm. but actually sort of also on that topic, the first thing of yours, so that's something I kind of like to do oftentimes is just sort of revisit what the, my first experience with my guests work is. Mm -hmm. And the first thing of yours that I ever read was actually a piece that you wrote for the cut last year. Uh -huh. um, and it was called becoming a woman who yells at her children, <laughs> that one. Yes. Which 
I like pre- prepping for this. I went back and I, I, I went and read a whole bunch of your other essays for the cut. And you've written a lot about pregnancy and parenthood and uh, the most recent one, what I want to hand down to my daughters and what I don't. There's a way that you write about this whole experience that feels very much of a piece with the novel, but also um, uh, different. And I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about how these two forms of writing fulfill different things or the same things for you, maybe? Mm -hmm. Um, That's a great question. And I appreciate you uh, doing the deep dive. That's so it's always really nice when um, people read things that you write. Uh, So, (laughs) yeah, I mean, I think uh, clearly I writing about uh, parenting and uh, parenthood is obviously something that is compelling to me. I just keep finding myself doing it. Um, And not only because uh, the cut, has a wonderful parenting uh, editor named Jen Gann. uh, And she's always kind of interested in uh, reading what I have to say about parenting. So I'm very fortunate in that regard. But it's funny, I, I I guess, when when the sort of the main thing that I wanted to do when I sat down to write the novel is to put something on a page that I felt like I hadn't really seen before. And I when I'm writing nonfiction things, I'm clearly like kind of working things out that I'm thinking about. And so the novel in some ways is doing the same thing, but there was more of a, there was kind of like an, a formal, like an kind of aesthetic consideration there that I don't feel the same way with nonfiction. Like nonfiction feels more or less straightforward to me. So it's more like the content, like the themes, uh, you know, for something like an essay, whereas, um, for a novel, the style also matters. Um, and of course there are nonfiction writers who have, you know, really, uh, very like particular kind of wonderful styles. So it's not like, you know, it's not like that isn't at play in nonfiction, but just for myself, uh, in my writing, they gave me different sort of vehicles to talk about parenting, let's say. Hmm. I mean, it's interesting because I feel like reading your essays that there is a, a very, distinctive voice I feel like when in your nonfiction writing Mm -hmm. and in particular like one of the ones that I was thinking about a lot was the one that you wrote for the cut last year where you're writing about what being pregnant feels like Uh which that piece I mean it's pretty short right but like (laughs) but I feel like there's a lot in it and it also like it's really funny it's really hilarious like I found myself laughing out loud when I was reading it But also there's a sort of like lyricism to the way that you write this, these descriptions. And like, to me, it wasn't just that they were funny, although they were funny, but also they were very beautiful. And there was a way that like the, the kinds of metaphors or similes or descriptions that you were using, I was like, wow, that is like a really perfect way to describe that. And I, it seemed also like, that style in that essay and in, in several of your essays, it wasn't terribly dissimilar from things that you were doing in the book. Mm-hmm. No, you're definitely right. Uh, that's, I mean, I think the, there's a sensibility that I have in my sort of general writing voice and a sensibility that I have um, generally that is shared by Daphne, the protagonist of the book who also narrates the book. So it's very, I mean, and it's funny how much, especially people I know well. Um, so, you know, friends I've had for a long time who are not writers and who read the book and they're like, I love the part when you are doing this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and they will say it's, a, a lot of people I know wrote and said, it's like you were just there telling me a story. Hmm. Um, and I mean, I think I'm, I'm of two minds about that. On the one hand, You know, I've always sort of said to myself and to other people that Daphne is not me. She's kind of a version. She's how I imagine myself in sort of a a different set of circumstances. Uh, But because because the circumstances are fundamentally different, we can never be the same person. So, Mm -hmm. you know, with certain conditions, people just are different. Um, But, you know, that's a bit of a cop out because obviously, you know, we share kind of a way of looking at the world in a certain uh, tendency toward like apocalyptic thinking. Um, (laughs) 
And I mean, she is very close to me. So, you know, when my friends say that, I, I, I mean, it, it makes me smile, but I'm also like, oh, I must, I'm like, that's shitty. <laughs> <laughs> my, my imagination just isn't good enough. And I'm actually, I mean, I think about this a lot now because I'm trying to write another book that is very, very different. Um, and I, I mean, I, I like tweeted this facetiously, um, but it's, I like, who is the third person? Cause it's really, uh, yeah, just thinking about voice and register um, apart from a first-person narrative. Like, there's still a person there um, and a sensibility, but how to extricate some of the kind of more patented, like, me voice moves, how to remove that from writing. And sometimes I'm like, well, why should I try and do that if this is the way that I sound uh, across different forms of writing, then that's the way I sound and I should just kind of do it. But I want to continue to do that kind of writing, but I also want to like get better and, and become more like, uh, adept at, at, in other sort of registers and styles, but it's definitely a process. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, I mean, because I know you've talked about in other interviews and, and, and writing you've done about the book, that there are aspects of the book that are um, that are sort of drawn from your life experience. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like, I mean, this is something that Alexandra Chi, for example, has written extensively about, uh, you know, he has a whole book that's called how to write an autobiographical novel. Yes. uh, Which I love. It's fantastic. Um, He's wonderful. He is. And, but this, this sort of way that people kind of, and it's not just the people who know you, right? But it, it, it often is, especially them. But how mm-hmm. oftentimes there is this real just unwillingness to engage with a piece of art on its own terms, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I find that that could be a little frustrating. I mean, for me, my own work is very explicitly drawn from my life, but photographs mm-hmm. are different from from literature in that way. Mm -hmm. But even so, like, I feel like I kind of find it a little, not tedious exactly, but like, sometimes people will take my photographs as a way to like, try to psychoanalyze me (laughs) when that's like, not really the, (laughs) what I'm going for, you know? Yeah. Well, and it also, um, I, I hesitate to use the word like disrespect because I, I'm there are occasions when you can accept it very kind of lightheartedly and it feels fine and occasions when it annoys you more, but, but it is, it kind of um, erases the choices that artists, whether they're photographers or writers or whatever they're doing, you know, there are a lot of very kind of intentional things that we're doing and um, choices that are being made. And so, yes, you know, even if there is a level of autobiography, um, there are also some very kind of pointed decisions that have been made to ch- pick and choose certain parts of a, you know, of your life and what to use and what not and what circumstances to change. And so, yeah, it's sort of, it's just like, okay, it makes it kind of seem as though, I think it's sort of on the kind of same continuum as when you meet people, there's kind of a thing where people will say, oh, a writer, like, I've always wanted to, you know, write my memoirs and just write it. And it's like, well, first of all, that's, it's really hard to write about yourself too. It's not like you just sit down and say, I'm going to put it all out there. And it's something, a product that anybody wants to read. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's it's kind of like a flattening of, uh, all of the work, I guess, that goes into writing anything. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that, um, just a, sort of also to go back to the first essay, but then connect it. There's, there's a line that you put in that, that becoming a woman who yells at her children essay mm-hmm. that I thought was really interesting where you were talking about Frank O'Hara. You said a literature is full of loners and assholes whose skills a- allows them to paraphrase Frank O'Hara to make the catastrophe of their personalities seem beautiful, mm-hmm. which I loved and I think is very true. And I was but when I was reading that, uh, when I went back and read it after I'd read your book, I was kind of wondering, like, if if that's something that you were kind of applying <laughs> to w- your own book as well. I don't know. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, first, I, I want to pause and say that the 
I have to do the, you know, my citation here, but the woman becoming a woman who yells, that's from a line from a Lauren Groff story. Right. And that's um, in the essay. Yes, it's in the essay. But, you know, for any for all the listeners out there uh, who who may not have read the essay, it it sort of takes this line um, that I found just so kind of evocative uh, from one of her stories and then goes from there um, as someone who kind of identifies with this a fictional um uh, creation of Lauren Graf's. But, um, yes, I mean, I, I, one thing when I was writing, um, Daphne and sort of coming up with her voice, which was like a very heightened kind of version of my own voice. Uh, I, I think that she, is kind of a pain in the ass, but I also, <laughs> I, I want, I, to me, the book is, would be completely miserable and, and completely unsuccessful if, uh, she was not meant to be a sympathetic character. I mean, a character that you can just say, wow, that it must be whether or not her circumstances are actually difficult. And some, you know, I was, I, you shouldn't read Goodreads reviews, but I do. And, um, <laughs> someone yesterday was like, well, you know, she, she has like a good job and she like inherited this property. So it's not, you know, she doesn't have real problems, which that is fine. Um, but, uh, you should still, I think the reader should take away that it is tough to, to, to be in her head, um, uh, and in her circumstances. And so, and I, I note that for people for whom the book is not successful at all, and you know, there are obviously readers who feel like that it's because they just, she's not, they just don't like her. Um, hmm. and yeah, and the, and the book, like there's not enough in the book, I think to carry it, uh, for a reader for 292 pages. If you just find her really kind of loathsome, um, hmm. the other details, I, I think that's just asking too much of the reader because you're, I'm already asking the reader to, uh, bear with the narrative for a lot of like just kid meltdowns and, like kids falling down <laughs> um, and string cheese and just a lot of repetitive actions. Um, and so to have those, you know, and then on top of that, have the person who's narrating them just be not like very compelling to you, that, that would be a lot. So yes, I, I was writing to make Daphne feel not necessarily lovable, but um, you know, worthy of, sympathy, I guess. Well, I mean, I, I do, I feel like that there is a sort of fundamental tenderness towards that character. Like, I feel like, you know, I don't feel like you are ever really pulling any punches here. Like she's, she seems to be fairly self-aware of, you know, how things are hard for her, but you know, like she's aware of the fact that, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I have a good job and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, that kind of thing. But I don't know, like, there's something about that comment about, like, whether or not the character is likable. <laughs> That's a very different question than whether or not the character is compelling, you know? Yeah, that's true. I should not conflate compelling and likable. Um, it's, yeah, it's funny that I have the instinct to do that. But, uh, I mean, I just, if someone is really... I was going to say, you know, when I think of like the villains, like famously villainous characters are always sort of more interesting and people like them. And that's like why Paradise Lost is kind of a, you know, the, the devil is like better <laughs> to read about, I guess. Um, so there's that. But I really, um, I guess I just, I think a lot about this is a kind of a non sequitur, but I was on the bus the other day and there was a little kid who, uh, was with, uh, maybe grandpa, I'm not sure who, but, um, who was just having like an absolute meltdown and, and just having the worst time. And, and any, any parent has been there. Anyone who's looked after a child has been there. Uh, and it was just, it was like, but for the grace of God, it was not my, I was bringing my <clears throat> daughter home from preschool and it just, so just as easily could have been her doing that. And, and it was a really crowded bus and like the, and there were a couple of people who are also men. And, they, and one of them was like, 
said to me as though I would relate to him. And, and he said something about how the kid was spoiled. And I, Ugh. I was, I was so furious. And I was like, I, I mean, I have no idea whether the person who said this to me, whether he had children or not, he wasn't very old, but, um, and I was just like, well, that's how children behave and are. And, uh, and every child does that sometimes, but it really, and I had never, you know, I'm just so much more indignant about remarks like that because I have been there and, and it just, it's hard to, uh, deal with children, even if you have very, uh, like rigid parenting standards for yourself. Uh, so I, yeah, I think that's part of it too, is like, when I was writing the characters, just to, to convey that it is very difficult, whoever you are, um, to have the care of a small person, um, have that be your sole responsibility. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, to me, one of the, the things about that I really appreciate about this book, um, for one, like you say, I don't think I've really ever read anything, any, any, any sort of, uh, fiction, that has really captured this experience in quite the same way, um, in a way that felt quite as authentic and immediate and sort of urgent to me. But, you know, I think that to say that the character doesn't have real problems for one is just kind of insensitive, but yeah, I mean, that's, I, I disagree with that, but yeah, um... but I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think to me, it's also kind of missing the point, which is, like to me anyway the uh, i've always found it very gratifying to know that other parents also have a hard time and it and that it's not you know that it that it is hard for just about everybody i think that there's a sort of service to that you know cuz i don't know like when my when my first was born like he didn't sleep more than 45 minutes at a time for the first 6 months of his life oh, God. and <laughs> And, my, you know, my wife and I were like just about at the end of our rope. And, you know, we had, it's like one of those things where you, you don't, it's not that nobody tells you it's going to be hard because everybody mm. tells you it's going to be hard, but it's like, you don't really realize exactly what that means until you're in it. And I yeah. feel like there's a way that making, like putting that experience so nakedly into a book like this is you know, I think that that actually makes, well, it certainly make me feel better anyway, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, one thing that's so funny to me about how, I mean, there, people will say, you know, if you work in some kind of communal setting with other people and you're expecting a baby, um, whether you are going to have the baby or, um, the baby's coming to you somehow, or, you know, your partner's giving birth to a baby, a baby's arriving, uh, from somewhere it's like, Oh, well say goodbye to sleep. Like, you know, there, there's all this, there's these kind of, um, scripts, social scripts that we have to, uh, acknowledge that it's tough to have a newborn, but the actual, nobody, I mean, we don't even have like parental leave <laughs> um, <laughs> and let alone, you know, if new parents who have come back to work and, you know, show up and are like, Oh, my child isn't, I haven't slept more than 45 minutes at a time in X months because of my child. Like that's not something that, you know, your boss wants to hear about necessarily. Um, <laughs> I mean, if, if they do, it's because you happen to have like a very understanding and kind boss, but it's not, there's no like that, that labor and that experience is all meant to be very much in the background. Um, it's not, you know, someone who, kind of made everyone in their like, especially I'm just, I'm thinking of the workplace, especially it just kind of narrated the experience of their parenthood at length to their coworkers. People would be like, shut up. Like that, that's yeah. Like you had kids like, fuck, congratulations. <laughs> uh, we all suffer. And, but it's just, it's, it's like, it's funny how, um, it's certainly not like a universal experience because not everyone has children, but it is a very, very common experience. And one that as a sort of society, we, we try and, uh, portray, you know, there's like the nuclear family is meant to be like very celebrated, but the things that actually like happen in it, uh, are, yeah, they're, they're always meant to be just kind of like they happen at night and only the people who are suffering <laughs> and not sleeping, um, hear about them or yeah, if, you know, kids melting down on the bus. That's like, everyone's like, 
why I don't want to see this. Um, yeah. That needs to happen somewhere else. Yeah. So there's this uh, thing that you were talking about in um, the interview you did for Electric Literature. Mm -hmm. That seems like this part of the, you know, what you were just saying kind of reminded me of it, where uh, you said that when you talk to women and men who have children, one thing that strikes you is the specificity of knowledge you have about your children and how to make the day work. It's this wealth of knowledge, but it'll just go away. It's this expertise that parents have in that moment of parenthood, and then it goes away. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is something about this book, about the sort of immediateness of it, that mm -hmm. there's something to me about, I mean, and maybe this is just because this is what my own work is often very concerned with, but the emotions that are portrayed in the sort of parenting parts of the book mm -hmm. are so heightened and they're very authentic to that heightened feeling that you have when you're in the middle of it. But I feel like there's a way in which, um, that it, it really highlights the sort of ephemerality of the moment as well. Mm -hmm. Um, which I thought was kind of interesting too, especially because for me, you know, my kids are, my youngest now is four and the oldest is 10. Mm -hmm. So like having a 16 month old is, is, is in our past now. And it's, yeah. it is really interesting how, how quickly those feelings become no longer immediate, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about that a lot right now because I, so uh, my older daughter's four and then my younger one is 16 months um, as of a few days ago. And it's so funny to me to compare to a, you know, compare how I felt having the first 16 month old I ever had, uh, and then having this new one. And I find myself, I feel <laughs> my poor second child. I keep kind of gazing at her and, and trying to, I mean, I have many wonderful and heightened feelings surrounding her, but they're almost uniformly, they're a like much more positive generally and much more like less, less kind of stormy. Um, basically when, when I had my older daughter and it's funny cause I actually thought as she was an easy baby, I had good hormones. I found the experience like mostly extremely positive. Um, but clearly it did something to me because I felt like I certainly this book would, I might, I hope I would have written another a different book, but I never would have written this particular book um, without her arrival. And I think one of the things that surprised me so much about it is those kind of heightened feelings and the, the just dramatic swings that you can have uh, in a mood within moments uh, in your mood within moments with when you're with children. And then so now I have the second one who's exactly the same age as honey is meant to be in the book. And a, she's just very different. She just does different things uh, than my older daughter did. Cause my, my older daughter is, you know, my model for writing about a, you know, toddler. Uh, and then also just my feelings are so much less, fraught, I guess. Um, so when I'm feeling those just wonderful feelings of how you, some, you just love your kids so much, or you're just, just happy to be near them. Um, I have those in a much less, I, I feel like when I, with my older daughter, when I had those feelings, I would also just be like, and you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> it would be like, or, you know, I love you so much and someone else's baby is dying right now. Um, and I, it's not, you know, it sounds like flippant, but that's how, I don't know. I felt very just kind of a, an, a wound in some ways and just how I, I would think about things. And, and then, yeah, I feel like I, now I'm just like, I've got this baby and she's really cute and I'm lucky not good. Um, and to have her and I can just sort of enjoy her more, but yeah, there's no book there. <laughs> my, my book inspired by my second child would be just, yeah, it's, and, and it's weird. It's like, it's like trying to remember, you know, if you have like done drugs and trying to remember what, what that was like when you're not in it, it's just, you can't. Uh, yeah. 
so I'm, I'm, and so I'm, I mean, the book already feels very kind of distant uh, to me in sort of interesting, strange ways, but, um, but one, I'm, I'm glad that I, if I ever want to sit down and actually read it, which it's so hard to imagine doing <laughs> at this point, but, um, I, I at least will know that if I did, I did have some of that. I put some of those feelings, uh, down somewhere. Um, yeah, even if I don't have them really anymore. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a way in which, you know, parenting, especially with your first kid, um, makes it really hard to be in the present because everything is either, you know, I, I became very obsessed with both the past and the future. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in talking about how, like being able to remember things, uh, I don't know if this is an awkward segue or not, but <laughs> there's, I, I feel like there's a lot in the book that is very concerned with memory mm -hmm. um, and the past. Um, mm -hmm. And so like part of that is the sort of like, things immediate how, how how the experience of parenthood is always immediately going into the past and you know leaving you know as as every experience happens it's it's already behind you but mm -hmm. i feel like so much in the book is in some way related to people either being stuck in the past reckoning with the past or being unable to reckon with the past and it mm -hmm. plays out in so many different ways whether it's uh even something like, hmm, like the ways that, like, so you have this, um, uh, the, the whole thing with the state of Jefferson people, and they mm -hmm. seem to be very enamored with an imagined past. Mm -hmm. There's the town itself, which is very old and run down and sort of focused on how things used to be mm -hmm. and how the, how Daphne herself thinks about her youth in that town and her youth abroad and meeting her husband and all of these things. Like the, uh, to me, in like a lot of ways, the book is, maybe about memory, but I don't know if that feels right to you. Uh, no, I think that's a very uh, good way of looking at it. And I mean, the book was written out of, uh, an interest in memory and kind of perception, um, in a few different ways. And I think, yeah, they all kind of play out in the book. So the, the first and, you know, relating to what we're talking about, I, I know so many people who, have uh, babies who say that they find themselves like looking at pictures of the baby on their phone, uh, like while the baby is there next to them. Uh, <laughs> so just going back and, and especially first babies, um, like looking at whatever pictures you have of the very newborn or the hospital and kind of going back in time and, and being very just kind of obsessed with holding on to those things and revisiting those things. Mm -hmm. Um, and I definitely did that. And then, yeah, so hearing from other uh, particularly new moms that they had also done that was really interesting to me. Um, so there's the kind of kid angle. Um, and then also, so place, I'm very interested in kind of obsessed with places especially and i and i've i really have like imprinted on places or places in, allowed places to imprint on me i'm not sure which direction that goes but um i guess the the latter but um because i moved around a lot when i was um a small child uh through adulthood so the longest i'm actually right now living in the longest span i've ever spent in one place uh and so this is we're entering the seventh year um, and within that, those seven years we've lived, we're now in our third apartment, so <laughs> we are still moving around. Uh, but just in one, we've been in one neighborhood and that's the longest I've ever spent anywhere. So I have all these kind of places that I keep returning to and thinking about and that just evoke various kind of specific feelings for me. And one of the places, um, was my mom's hometown because even while we moved around a lot, that was this constant and we would go and visit and the, and my grandparents house there, um, was a constant. And so, um, it was just a place that meant a lot to me. And then in the years since my grandparents died, um, and we would go back more and more or less frequently. Um, and when I go with, and I would always go with my mom and, you know, there's the sadness of not having the people there anymore who made a place important, for you. Um, but then in the 
case of this particular town, and the town in the book is based on a town called Alturas in uh, northeastern California, uh, the town just has has changed, um, and there there are fewer people living there. And I mean, there's still lots of people living there, and many things happening. So I don't want to imply that you know people aren't like having wonderful lives there. But as far as it related to my my you know mom experience of the town and my own um it had changed and yeah I don't know I just couldn't I kept thinking about it and kept I'm feeling sort of lonesome for it and missing it and but there's no way you can't go back uh Mm. to a place because it's not you the people aren't there and you're not the same person so that was another thing that I was really thinking about um and then yeah I mean and that it does align very much with the rhetoric for, I mean, and that's like our political rhetoric as a whole, um, horrible, like make America great again. That's part of the same kind of nostalgic view. Um, and I think there are, there are, there are real and legitimate economic, especially considerations in some of those nostalgic views. Um, so, you know, I think it's okay to, to say like, yes, a place is different and has like, people are not enjoying the same standard of life that they once did in the area of Northeastern California where the book takes place. Like the hospital recently went bankrupt. It was a huge, huge like boondoggle that is going to, the cost is going to be transferred basically to the residents and it's the poorest County in California or the second poorest County in California. So, you know, there are real things that are happening that are crappy. Um, but yes, it's very easy to kind of, to then be, become like romantic about the past. And it's funny cause I, it's easy for me to, uh, to say that other people are doing that, but it's like my, okay, so what, 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 nost- what memories do I have that are, what sort of nostalgic feelings do I have that are more complicated if I really like dug into them. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that was a very long one. No, answer. no, no, it's perfect. I, you know, one of the things I was thinking about with it too, is like, uh, because of this, this whole sort of imaginary or, you know, it's not to say imaginary because obviously like, as you're saying, the residents of that area, many rural areas have real problems facing them that they, uh, you know, historically hadn't been facing. And, you know, whatever the reasons that things used to be better, obviously like, and you've talked about this before, the ways that, that, um, you know, sort of settler colonial paradigms have, you know, enabled a better standard of life for people by oppressing other people. That's certainly a thing, but whatever the reasons are, like people are facing real problems now. Um, and, and I think, uh, it's very interesting to how that area of California is one that I think even Californians often forget exists, Mm -hmm. but you know, one of the things that stuck to me the most about that was how the sort of main sort of interface that Daphne has with that sort of right wing group, uh, there is, is, uh, her neighbor Mm -hmm. who is actually from San Bernardino. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yes, (laughs) I, I don't mean to slander the town of San Bernardino. Um, well, I think, I mean, especially around, like, let's put it this way. I hear a lot about people who have conservative politics moving to places where they feel their politics will be more mainstream, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, where, But I don't really, I mean, I, I don't hear so much about, yeah, I don't know. That That's just, some, some, I, maybe the opposite thing is, phenomenon is also true. But um, in California, there are a lot of, depending on what, if you like look at certain like sort of message boards or like newsletters, you can read about people like moving to Texas. That's a place where, you know, people either leave California because they can't afford it anymore or because they are mad about the politics. I'm I'm sure there are also like more complicated factors, but um, the conservative Californians will decide that the system of taxation here is too oppressive or burdensome. Um, and so they've decided to go somewhere better or that environmental regulations are stymieing some effort that they would like to make. And so they can go somewhere else where they have a reduced burden um, that there's like that. I don't know, in fact, how many people really do that, but you can definitely um, find people online sort of saying like, that's why we left California because we mm-hmm. just couldn't couldn't take it anymore. Um, 
Wow, I've completely lost my. <laughs> no, I mean, no, but I think it's really, <laughs> yeah, I think it's really uh, one of the things that that definitely comes up a lot in, you know, the the characters in your book do talk about this and and in ways that very much mirror the way that people from that part of the state actually talk. That there's this sort of sense that nobody else in the state really gives a shit about them or even yeah. knows that they're there. And mm -hmm. the funny thing is that like. On the one hand, that kind of rhetoric is a very common sort of rural dialogue that's happening mm -hmm. right now. But it's actually kind of true, too, because like, like, just for example, like I grew up outside of Carmel, right? So, okay. so now I live in San Diego, and everybody here would call where I grew up Northern California. But mm -hmm. when I was growing up, Northern California was like up there, you know, yeah. like it would be like I would think of like Humboldt County as being Northern mm -hmm. California. And you know, this is even further north than that. And there's there there really is a way that like even people who are from fairly far north in the in the state, like where where you're from the you live in the Bay Area now, mm -hmm. people do forget that that the like policy decisions in California aren't really taking that part of the state into consideration. So there's like a resentment that that people have there that might be like how it gets expressed might not be great, but it's not, yeah. it's not driven by nothing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, things like I'm not like a public policy person, so I cannot say, you know, with any certainty how things are actually like applied. Uh, but there's not like no point to be made when I, so I'm on, I, I'm on like a mailing list for state of Jefferson, just like I signed up for an email. So I get the newsletter when it, when it comes out just cause I'm interested in what, what they're saying. And I signed up when I was writing the book. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, the gas tax was like a big thing and I am very pro gas tax because I don't have a car. So it's not really a, my problem is, is you know, on the one hand I feel very strongly that like the fossil fuel economy is like, we're going to all die if we don't um, just change that. Uh, so there's that, but on the more, it's it's more convenient for me to have that that mindset because I I don't you know uh, the price of gas does not immediately affect me or you know in ways that are that are really obvious to me so you know when I and then I open this newsletter and it's like the gas tax like screws like rural people uh, because if you are driving really far distances um, or if you you know have like farm equipment that needs fuel. And so then you're like, Oh, you know, that's, that's a real, that's a concern. Um, one thing that I thought was funny after I wrote my book is that someone who I know who is from California, she didn't say it to me, but she said it to a third party who reported to me. She was like, isn't it funny how Lydia made up that stuff about the state secessionists and, uh, <laughs> my, the third party who is, uh, not, from the state of California or from America even was like, Oh no, I'm pretty sure that that's real. Yeah. Uh, and the other person was like, no, it's like, that's just, it's like it's just sort of an amalgam of other things in politics. And she's like, no, that's definitely a real thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's like, the state is huge. Um, and certainly parts of it kind of take, uh, more space, I guess, than the public imagination than others. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we need to take a little break and then we can come back and do the second segment. Okay. Okay. So uh, for the second segment, I always invite the guests to bring a topic of their own, which can be whatever you'd like to talk about, whatever's on your mind. So what would you like to talk about today? Uh, so I would like to talk about uh, Marshall and Phyllis Hodgson. So the, the book is dedicated, uh, it's in memory of Phyllis Hodgson, and sometimes people ask who that is. So I just thought I'd talk about them. And I will start with um, Marshall Hodgson. So Marshall Hodgson was a um, historian, in specifically a historian of like the Islamic world, uh, what he called the Islamic cut. He, he had, well, well, I'll get to that in a second, but, um, so he, uh, was at the university of Chicago and he died in 1968. He was a very young man. He was only 46 and he died suddenly. And 
when he died, he was in the process of completing a massive, massive three volume thing called The Venture of Islam. And it was com- the third volume ended up being completed by colleagues uh, with the assistance of his widow, Phyllis, uh, after his death. So he's not a super, I guess it's one of those things like many aspects of academia. Um, he's very well known within his particular kind of discipline and especially at the University of Chicago. But then beyond that, you know, A, he died a long time ago and B, it's just kind of a not a, you know, he wasn't like a public intellectual and in that he was not like, you know, writing things and for um, mainstream audiences mm-hmm. and things like that. But anyway, so I um, went, I did a master's degree in Middle Eastern studies at the University of Chicago. And that is the only reason that I ever heard of him. But I noticed from the very beginning of that two year program that he was spoken of just so reverently, you know, all the professors would say, well, you know, Marshall Hodgson was a professor here. And he basically developed the first sort of courses in let's say like Middle Eastern studies or Islamic, you know, kind of Islamic history. Um, all of the terms are very imprecise, uh, which was something that really bothered him. But hmm. um, in America, um, because, you know, what's called area studies is a thing that it's a kind of a Cold War era thing. Um, and, you know, learning about kind of other regions, cultures, languages, and sort of dividing the world up into different parts. Um, okay, I'm going to get way, <laughs> I'm gonna get way <laughs> off track here. Um, in any case, he uh, was just talked about very in these like very reverent terms. And it really interested me just at, like, at one point, a photo was shown of a bunch of like, white guys in their 40s in suits. And it was a black and white photo. And the person who showed the photo was like, one of these is Marshall Hudson. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and I was like, that's just, it's, it was just an interesting way for people to talk about someone. So um, then I learned that uh, his archives were at the University of Chicago. Started, I started going through them and through a combination of just kind of tidbits I collected from professors uh, and other students. And then through reading the archive, his archives, I found that he had a really, um, really sad personal life. I mean, he already was in kind of imbued with this like tragic aspect because he had died so young and there was very much a sense of like sort of the incompleteness and that he had been this like great mind and had all this stuff left that he was going to do and he wasn't able to do it. So he already had, you know, this, his legend was sad in that way. But I learned that he had had three daughters and I sort of had like differing accounts, but Um, My understanding was that two of them um, were twins and they had died of a terrible like childhood illness and people were sort of unclear on all of the details. But I ended up writing my thesis about him just kind of wanting to describe like what his basically I was intrigued by the fact that there was so little that seemed kind of confirmed about him, even though it was the very recent past. Uh, and, you know, there were people at the university who had met him. There wasn't kind of like an official account of what exactly he had done at the university. And he had been an administrator also. And I was curious about that. So that's what I wrote my thesis about. But really what I wanted, I wanted like his like personal story. There was something a little bit like vampiric about it, I guess. Um, but I wanted to know about his daughters and his wife. Um, and so what I learned is that, yes, he had had three daughters and that they were had all died at various points. And I kept asking as I was speaking with people who had known him, I'd say, well, you know, what happened to his wife? Uh, and most of people were like, well, I think she, she, you know, she moved away and then she, I guess she died. And that's kind of what I kept hearing. And I, but I wasn't satisfied because I never found like a death notice or anything like that for her. And I no longer now remember the various like machinations uh, through which I like found her. But I talked to someone who talked to someone who gave me the name of an assisted living facility in Wisconsin, in rural Wisconsin. And so I called um, or maybe I emailed and they said that I needed to talk to the 
the people who had her like power of attorney. And then I spoke with them and, you know, I just said that I had worked on Marshall Hodgson's archives and was always interested in uh, learning more about Phyllis and, you know, asked if I could talk with them or talk with her. And they were like, okay, (laughs) (laughs) you you can, uh, you can come. And so I arranged to go to Wisconsin and meet her. Um, and I had no, I was working on my novel at that time. I had written a piece or I guess I also, I had had a pitch accepted for the New York times magazine to write about Marshall Hodgson in a very, very short format. And I had been trying to write about him for years, um, for like some kind of like, uh, more mainstream publication after I wrote my thesis. Cause I had all of this like research and I was like, but I should do something with it. But it was just, I'm, I'm a not very good at pitching and there was just not like the quote unquote, like timely peg, uh, that was required. But the New York times magazine has this wonderful letter of recommendation feature and you just recommend something basically and describe it. And it's very short, uh, but it does not need the timely peg. So I finally was able to convince them that I could, to Marshall Hodgson. So I was technically working on that, but I didn't really know. I just wanted to meet Phyllis Hodgson. And so I met her and she was 92. And, and I learned also from her kind of caretakers who she did not have a living family that was in her life. Um, she had like, I think a cousin, um, or a niece, but you know, they were not close and, had never like lived near one another. So her community in Wisconsin basically looked after her as she got older. Um, and so I spoke with the, uh, the couple who just kind of like brought her into their family and made her part of their lives and, and then looked after her once she couldn't live by herself anymore. And she went to this really, really nice uh, place and that's where I met her and I met them. And so she talked to me a little bit. Um, she didn't have a super clear memory, but she just said a few things that really, really stuck with me. Um, and I learned, uh, that they had had the twin daughters and they had an illness. I think it's the closest thing is the illness. If, if you've seen the movie, uh, Lorenzo's oil at this are genetic, hmm. just always fatal, uh, degenerative diseases. Um, and so the, the twin girls, the first they had been diagnosed when they were about two years old required a huge amount of care an increasing amount of care that Phyllis basically did on her own. And then with the help of various, uh, men who had been like previously incarcerated or, or were, uh, had like mental health issues and that would Marshall Hodgson would like invite them to stay at their house um, because apparently he didn't believe that they should pay someone to like look after their children. So it had to be more of like a cooperative thing, Hmm. which to me, I was just like, I cannot believe that. But (laughs) um, she, uh, you know, he had very kind of stern standards about things and as did she, but I'm what I would have loved to talk with her about is like childcare stuff, but, uh, we weren't able to like have that like level of conversation. But so one of, but one of the girls, um, died in early childhood. I think she was about seven years old and then Marshall Hodgson died. And then the second twin died a few years later and, um, the surviving daughter then died when she was 35. So I just like, thinking about that amount of loss was very just kind of staggering. Um, and I don't know the fact that Marshall Hodgson, you know, he's not famous, but he is definitely like in the halls of kind of intellectual history. Like his, he has his book and he's going to, you know, there was just a big conference that someone did about him in Paris with a lot of people. And then she was also there just kind of like more, she just like, surviving him was, was a big thing of her life. And that, I don't know, really struck me. Um, and I just talked about this for a very long time. (laughs) Um, and, and then she, um, she died 
about, I think a year after, yeah, about a year after I had visited her. And so I went back for her memorial. Um, and yeah, the, and I love the people so much who were kind of her, formed her community because they were never like, they never were really like, explain exactly what you're doing because I didn't, I didn't know exactly what I was doing anyway. You know, they just, they just sort of accepted my presence there as someone who, I don't know, just cared about her. And then the, yeah, the most kind of meaningful feedback I got after my book is that they wrote and, and said that they felt it was true to her kind of spirit um, because the character of Alice is like modeled after her. Right. Um, that meant a lot to me. Um, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that, you know, hearing you talk about this and, and, and hearing about her and your interest in her, you know, the writer, uh, Rachel Syme. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She just recently started a new, um, newsletter, an email newsletter called adventurous. Mm -hmm. That is, um, the first one just came out, I think like a week or two ago. And she was, she's writing about women writers. I, th and I'm not sure if they're all going to be like sort of people who were overlooked at the time. The first one mm -hmm. was about Joyce Johnson's memoir, minor characters and how she was sort of if she was known at all, she was sort of known as having been in the orbit of Jack Kerouac, uh -huh. but how like her memoir is this really sort of biting, like kind of cutting thing that, that is just brilliant and how her story ends up being, especially over the course of her whole lifetime ends up being much more interesting than Kerouac's was, uh -huh. but that still how she was kind of, still overlooked and, and since if she's known at all, seen as kind of a minor writer, mm -hmm. I just can't really help thinking about how, and this also reminds me of the thing I was talking about with Brandon Taylor once, um, uh, for um, when he was on the show about how, you know, so often he finds that the characters on the margins are the ones that are the most interesting. Yeah. There is that way that I feel like, you know, so much of these, uh, the, the truly, whether it's inspiring or, or just like a good story, um, mm -hmm. is, are, are the ones that people aren't necessarily looking at in maybe the way that they deserve. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, and, and in this case, like, I can't like fault, um, people who, thought of, you know, it's not like she and Marshall Hodgson had the same career and he just got really famous in the career and she didn't, you know, it's not, it's not that like sort of cut and dried. Um, but, you know, going back to in our first half of the conversation, that sort of like invisible labor of kind of caring for children, mm -hmm. um, that I thought about that a lot when I was thinking about her. And then also, she told me one thing that she did say when I met her, which I had no idea because there's no, there's nothing in his archive that is about this. And, you know, there really wouldn't need to be, but um, she mentioned that she had wanted to be a writer and wanted, and she wrote plays and then, and she also wrote poems and that I like got, I was like just completely overcome when she said that, but so she said that she wanted to be, you know, she always wanted to be a writer and then, but she had babies and they kind of railroaded her life. And that was her expression. Yeah. Um, and that's in the book too, right? Yes. And I just, and her, you know, having babies and having them railroad your life was a very common phenomenon. I mean, in hers, it was just the most, it was a very dramatic version of that because of the illness of her children. So not only did she have the, the just general kind of, domesticity kind of takes over and especially at that point in time you know that's was the woman's job basically to deal with but then it was this kind of domesticity that also it was so much more intense than most people's version of it and so sad um and so you know doing the work of like child rearing but also basically being like a hospice nurse and then a grieving person that's just like so much to think about. Um, and then, and the way that she still spoke about these periods, I mean, talk about like memory and the past, but by the time I spoke with her, Marshall Hudgen had been dead for half a century and they had only been married for what amounted to like 10, I think it was about 
10 years. I don't, I used to know all the dates kind of, um, but now they're, they're, a lot of them are escaping me, but it really wasn't that long, but he's still, you know, that was like the defining, you know, that was like, she never met anyone else who she wanted to marry. Um, not that he was like the defining thing about her life, but the way that she still spoke about him so kind of presently and his photo was still, um, was like right by her bed in her room in this home. And, and all, another thing she spoke about is that she had taught school for, again, what amounted to a very short amount of time. Like she probably did it for two years, I think. Um, she did this and that, and she also had joined the Navy. So she had had a lot of like experiences and they, they just meant so much to her, even though they were brief and a long time ago. And I think especially, I mean, my grandmother also was a wave and she talked about that time always just so fondly um, and have been such a defining moment. And so, yeah, just thinking about the things that really shape your whole life, even if they don't happen for very long, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah I'm trying to think of what other like facts about her. She was just such a kind of interesting person. And then, I mean, through her, I, and so Marshall Hodgson was a Quaker. That was a very, kind of important thing about him. Um, and she, they had both gone to Quaker schools and while reading about, there was a time when her narrative was going to be more pronounced in the book. And then I changed track, but I was reading about Quakers because Quakers are just interesting to me. And then I, uh, ended up reading this biography, I guess, or sort of a memoir. It's called, I think it's called held in the light. And it's by a woman who is the widow of um, the Quaker Norman Morrison, who self-immolated to protest the Vietnam War in front of McNamara's office. Mm. Uh, I, and I remember hearing about that. And I was like, wow, that's just like, I can't believe having that there are people who had that much sort of conviction. Um and like what that was very kind of striking to me. But then I also learned, you know, he left, he didn't tell his wife that he was going to do that. And he had their baby with him. Um, I think they had three children and one was a, basically a newborn or a few months old. And he brought her, uh, to do this and oh accounts, accounts differ on what actually happened, whether he intended always to have her with him, like, and set her on fire too. I mean, he ended up like sort of tossing her to the side. Um, so she was basically unharmed. Uh, so people were kind of unclear on like what his plan was, whether he always was planning to like have her be spared or whether she was like part of the plan. But yeah, like set, even setting aside that like completely like astonishing thing, you know, his, like he left his wife, um, to with their small children, uh, to go and do that. And that, that just, yeah, it's sort of thinking about the other people who are in stories, um, is always interesting. And I mean, his, the, his widow, you know, wrote this book and she had a very, uh, magnanimous view toward him because she eventually went to Vietnam and met a lot of people who were very, very, very moved by what he had done. And so she like, she took a view of it that I don't know that I would be able to take. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, this is another more tangents, but yeah, because of Phyllis Hodgson, I just sort of like le read about like other people. Um, and I still don't know how they all fit together in my mind, but they just are together in this like place. that's like important, interesting people. Yeah. 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 Well, so there's there's one uh, question that I always like to end with, um, mm -hmm. and you maybe kind of answered it, but we'll, we'll see. Um, and that's just whether there's a, a piece of art or literature or some form of creativity that you've experienced recently that meant something to you. Well, I'm nearing the right before I we got on the phone. I was like finishing up. I'm still a few pages from the end, but I'm reading a novel uh, that's coming out in, I guess, April. Um, it's called The Parisian, and it's by Isabella Hamad. Hmm. And it, it's just a gorgeous book. Um, I'm really kind of blown away by how good it is. Um, and it's a book that takes place mostly in 
Palestine in during the period of the British mandate. Um, and it starts with a man who is sent uh, to go study medicine in France and then returns and is supposed to help his father run his business uh, in Nablus. The, I think that's how you pronounce the town. Um, and gets married and it just becomes this like family story, but also it's a work of history um, and about what was happening in as, you know, movements for uh, various like Arab independence movements um, and the kind of French and British interference. Um, and that all of those things very matter very much today and like have affected the way the whole world <laughs> works. Um, and I'm just, I can't, and so I love it because it's both, it seems like a really deep work of the historical fiction, but also just as like a wonderful, like a family story um, and about like marriage and work and relationships. And it's just so good. Oh, all right. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. I really appreciate it. Um, I have had a wonderful time. Thank you. Okay, so if you're going to be in the Los Angeles area this weekend, do check out Lydia's panel at the LA Times Festival of Books. That's Sunday, April 14th, 2019, and there's a link in the show notes for that. And that is our show. If you'd like to get in touch, you can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Channel Open Pod, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Keep the Channel Open, or you can send an email to podcast at Keep the Channel Open dot com. If you'd like to support the show, a monthly pledge in any amount to our Patreon campaign is greatly appreciated. It also gets you access to our subscriber only bonus content. You can find that at Patreon.com slash Sake River, that's Sake Like the Drink, and River Like River. And please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts that does help new listeners find the show. Our theme music is by Poddington Bear. You can find more of his music available for licensing at soundofpicture.com. We'll be back on April 24th with a conversation with writer David Bowles, so do be sure to come back for that one. And until then, remember, keep the channel open. (laughs) 